recargar energías y bueno, como veis, nuestra mesa es... Well, let us resume our, our round table. As you can see, we've got more speakers in this panel than in the previous one. So after having looked at the legal framework for the management of UCH and the, all the complexities both at national and international level, especially for sunken state vessels, and the uh, difficulties uh, regarding the coordination of the different countries uh, regarding, uh, regardless of whether they have ratified the convention or not. We have uh, decided that uh, so as uh, to um, have a better explanation of how works are conducted in terms of uh, archaeological uh, practices, we would be organizing this panel uh, so as to better know the practices uh, uh, conducted according to the ICONOS Charter and the Convention. In that regard, we have invited uh, several experts from different countries so as to know how they manage their UCH and they will provide us with uh, specific uh, practice uh, cases they will also brief us on how they cooperate with the different governments and the different civil societies. We also have the pleasure of uh, having uh, representatives of NGOs which play a fundamental role in the protection of UCH. We at the public administrations cannot actually embrace everything, so we need the collaboration from different stakeholders, among them accredited NGOs. So let us uh, give the floor to our uh, neighbors uh, to uh, France, uh, let us give the floor to Arnaud and to Franca. They both work at Drasam in France. I have already met uh, uh, Franca previously um, as part of a previous uh, project. This will be. Uh, she is a great archaeologist. We met uh, in 2013 at an international meeting on UCH that was held in Bruges in, in Belgium. They will tell us about an exemplary case in the management of UCH by the Drazam. They are very active in the uh, convention, in the application of the convention, in the ratification of the convention. And mm, they have also been working with uh, countries such as countries, uh, countries such as the United States. They have taken part in the Eskerki project. I am referring to Arnott here. And uh, their works, uh, both works, are an example for us uh, to follow. They have one of the main centers for the recovery of UCH, especially wood, uh, for wooden objects. You've got the best uh, Leo Philizer machine in your museum in France. Now let me give the floor. We are looking forward to listening to your case study. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation. Again, thank you very much to the organizers and especially to Maria for her invitation. Also, thank you very much uh, to the organizers, as I'm saying, for the excellent organization of this meeting. I have decided that I will give my presentation in Spanish. I will be nevertheless showing an English uh, PowerPoint presentation on the screen. Today we will be talking to you about an excavation 
project that we have recently conducted. We believe it is an interesting project and it refers to an, uh, a looting case of a wreck. The conclusion has been very satisfactory both at national and international level. As I was saying, the wreck was first discovered in 2017. However, the DRASM um, could uh, make an intervention because it was, an, um, it was a very well protected uh, site. Uh, however, we had to interrupt our works because of the COVID-19. Following the COVID-19, we entered and we recovered the, the, the wreck. We, it was a well-preserved shipwreck of the Hellenistic uh, period. For us, it was a major shipwreck. The problem, however, as I am saying, is that between 2021 and 2022, there was an extensive looting and there on the screen you can see some images and that looting uh, seriously affected the site and so part of the site has been destroyed by looters. Following the looting and following its denouncement, all the authorities started working so as to catch the offenders, the main offenders. Unfortunately, they were caught. And then, thanks to that, we have uh, seized uh, over 140. And we also found uh, some uh, shipwrecks uh, located in other areas. Therefore, we are very grateful to the work of law enforcement. Uh, we decided, therefore, to protect the shipwreck uh, afterwards because we didn't want it to um, uh, remain open. And so we decided to uh, take uh, three tons of sand diversed on the site so as to avoid for any possible future robberies. This sand will be removed or will be replaced by new one uh, every year. So thanks to the work of police forces and uh, civil protection forces, we managed to reach a very successful conclusion. Uh, the uh, shipwreck is in shallow waters and therefore it is uh, very accessible for um, divers in, in general. We decided to conduct an, a study, a three-year project so as to start with the documentation process, we first started working with the Federes and also with the Art Museum. We will also work with the IRAP, which is the Center for Preventive Archaeology in France. We will also work with other national and international archaeological centers. We first started collecting uh, scientific uh, documentation, archaeological documentation, which is of fundamental importance. We collected uh, important uh, data. We also found very fragile objects so as, uh, that now will have to be restored and thereby protected. It is also interesting to note here how this shipwreck has given us the possibility to highlight the uh, uh, state-run uh, action uh, together with the possibility of uh, publication, a scientific paper, 
and a display of the objects, thereby raising awareness among civil society. In that regard, uh, we have also produced a TV documentary, and more documentaries uh, will be produced uh, precisely um, in the coming months. Actually, we have uh, been working in collaboration with the Town Hall of Cannes, and we are also conducting a project, a project at uh, uh, St. Marguerite Island. And we are working um, by the creation of a character, a novel character, by Dumas' uh, character. And so, thanks to the works of this wreck, uh, shipwreck, we will be organizing a major exhibition so as to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the opening of the Archaeological Museum in Cannes. Another important action that we have conducted is the following. It is a collaboration with international institutions. Uh, we first started working with these international institutions in 2023. We have uh, signed an agreement with the uh, Marine Archaeological uh, Center, Underwater Center in Catalonia with the uh, Kazakh they are experts in restoration and they work very closely with the um, uh, with the Grenoble Museum. We are also trying to establish an agreement so as to exchange competencies and exchange skills for restoration and scientific and, and technical skills improvement and upgrading. We will also work in collaboration with the UCUA Zadar in Croatia. And hopefully next year we will continue working under the aegis of this shipwreck international network. We are also aiming at um, requesting a best practices uh, label recognition because we believe that the works that we conducted on this ship were a wreck uh, actually really deserves it because of its importance. Thank you very much, Franca, for sticking to the uh, time. Thank you very much for your project, which has a double perspective, first scientific and then awareness, um, uh, ra awareness raising uh, to civil society. It is fundamental for improving the involvement of civil society in UCH uh, protection. No doubt it will be included as a part of the best uh, practices for, uh, the, uh, for UCH. Um, and now let me give the floor to the next uh, speaker and we will have our round of Q&A at the end of all the presentations. Our next speaker is Caterina Della Porta. She is also an archaeologist. She has been working for many years in marine archaeology. She also works uh, as a liaison officer between the Ministry of Culture and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. She has previously worked in the Council of Europe and she has been working in this field for the last uh, 25 years. She has also been a director 
of the Archaeological Museum. I think it is very interesting for us to listen uh, to the works being conducted in Greece, a country surrounded by sea, and also because of the enormous amounts of islands and the enormous amount of UCH that can be found in its uh, waters just uh, coming uh, from the old uh, ages. Greece is, however, a country that has not ratified the convention, but has been very actively working in UCH protection. I first met Katerina some years ago in a Denmark uh, meeting, and we have always uh, uh, collaborated a lot. Thank you. Culture and UNESCO for this initiative, and uh, of course of, of be on behalf of my colleagues also, Dr. Banu and uh, Dr. Kurkumelis, who are in charge of the FRA of Underwater Antiquities now in Greece. Uh, the purpose of this... Uh, uh, the purpose of this uh, short presentation is to give a comprehensive approach on the protection and management of underwater archaeological heritage in Greece according to international law and Greek legislation, which provide for a enforced protection of antiquities. Greece is a maritime country whose seas contain 6,300 islands, given that the coastline of Greece is around 17,000 kilometers long, that corresponds to 25% of the total shoreline of the Mediterranean, and one of, the, of that is uh, second in size in Europe only to Norway. The Ministry for Culture established in 1976 a special archaeological service for underwater antiquities with competence covering the whole geographic region of Greece. The protection of underwater antiquities in a marine, lacustrine, or a riverine environment is recognized as a fundamental obligation of the Greek state by the Hellenic Constitution, which is referring to the protection of the environment as well. The task of protecting sites and monuments absolutely belongs to the competence of the archaeological service of the Ministry for Culture, an integral part of Greece's public sector, and this authority and tasks are governed by the archaeological law of 2002 which was codified in 2021. The new codification of the archaeological law provides expresses verbis in Article 15 for the management and operation of the visitable marine archaeological sites in cooperation with the local government, diving centers, and port authorities. In its Article 15b, the law also includes includes the express protection of wrecks sunk 50 years ago, the definition of shipwrecks as cultural heritage sites, and the designation as monuments sunk in ships and aircraft 50 years or older as of the date of their sinking, including the movable finds contained there within due to their historical, technological, scientific, and cultural significance. The new legal framework distinguishes in part the protection zones of the coastal and marine areas, the port works, but mainly the sanctions in case, of, in case of violation of the terms of the legislation. In other words, the codified archaeological legislation includes express provisions that cover the entire spectrum of underwater antiquities with regard to their protection and management as a whole. The provisions of the law also cover underwater cultural heritage located within the borders of the Greek territory, including territorial waters, as well as within other maritime zones in which Greece exercises relevant jurisdiction in accordance with international law. On this point, the archaeological law is in full harmony with the spirit expressed by other international conventions such as the United Nations Convention of, on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS, and the UNESCO Convention on the Protection of the Underwater Cultural Heritage. However, Greece is not among the member states of the UNESCO Convention abstaining from voting with a statement. 
The UNESCO Convention is important for diffusing the philosophy of the common responsibility for the protection of underwater archaeological heritage, recognized as, an, as of outstanding universal value in the benefit of mankind. In addition, the most important achievement of the Convention is its annex, drafted by archaeologists with a view toward te technical considerations, the annex benefited from unanimous support at the time of its adoption. It restates the need to, to preserve underwater cultural heritage in situ and also allows the possibility to adopt different measures for protecting or diffusing the knowledge of underwater cultural heritage. The annex further reaffirms the idea that cultural objects should not be considered as commercial goods. However, the main question still remaining in, in is what type of law is applicable for underwater archaeology in international waters as there is no uniform treatment across national legal systems. In addition to the above mentioned Greek law referring to sites and monuments, another legislation referring to the protection of the envi environment and to the protection of coast and littoral landscapes includes uh, specific provisions for the protection of underwater antiquities. Within the framework of the legislation, the Ministry for Culture implements the following practices that enhance the protection and contribute to informing and raising public awareness of underwater cultural heritage. The designation of underwater archaeological sites, submerged settlements and wrecks as requiring special legal protection the protected areas today amount to 191 uh, and are registered in the National Archaeological Land Registry of the Ministry of Culture. The provision of financial rewards for reporting shipwrecks and surrendering antiquities from the sea, a measure that might be under discussion. The policing of Greek waters and their coastal zones with the aim of suppressing illegal underwater activities placed solely, uh, solely in the hands of the local harbor authorities. Taking account that culture according to the European Treaty belongs to the domain of subsidiarity, it is obvious that any legislation on this purpose in the frame of EU is a priori excluded and that protection of such heritage in international level is obtained of, uh, by other fora such as UNESCO and mainly by the European Convention of the Council of Europe for the Protection of Archaeological Heritage, La Valletta, 1992, the Article 2.2 in Latin, and secondly, the European Landscape Convention, Laos, now as Florence Convention. How is underwater maritime archaeological heritage protected in Greece? Its blanket protection had preserved underwater archaeological heritage to a very high degree compared to other countries of the Mediterranean Basin. The question that arises from the above is how the underwater archaeological heritage would be defined, managed and protected within the explosion of economic activity that will follow. The Ministry for Culture organized already some sites open to the divers and accessible to the divers and it is uh, undertaking a big project for the construction of a new museum of underwater antiquities at the Silo building in, in Piraeus. To sum up, a strong legal framework is not enough sufficient to preserve and protect underwater cultural heritage if political willing is not ensured, together with the awareness and education of the public in these matters, to make them and also the various authorities, especially the local ones, understand that submerged antiquities and their context are not to be regarded as objects of a transient financial exploitation, but as a trust in keeping for future generations. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias por tu presentación, al igual que... Thank you very much for your presentation. 
Thank you very much also for your summary and also for sticking to your time and also thank you very much for your reflection on the importance of uh, raising awareness among citizenships of the importance of uh, a UCH. We still have a long way ahead in all countries. Now let me give the floor to our third speaker. Thank you very much, Ryan, for, your, for accepting our invitation. Ryan comes from Florida, and he is the person responsible for the archaeological department in the uh, state of Florida. We met in Tallahassee, where they uh, are uh, showing, showcasing an enormous amount of uh, objects coming for wrecks for us, for Spain. It was impressive seeing how much of research has been conducted on the on the wrecks and some some of them Spanish uh, they also pro have provided us with a specific uh, the specific location of the wrecks they have also made important ex efforts in terms of conservation they have um, an interesting and powerful department for conservation of maritime objects uh, the united states is a country that has uh, ratified the convention and um, the uh, united states has got uh, extensive and profound collaboration with the Kingdom of Spain. To be here today to meet everyone, but also get to share a little bit about how we do things in Florida. Um, Madrid is absolutely lovely. Uh, I'm very happy to have accepted this invitation, so thank you again. Um, as uh, a representative of the United States, uh, I'm representing the state of Florida, uh, and my goal today is to be able to convey to you how we aim to proactively and successfully manage our underwater cultural heritage. Um, there is a lot of uh, agreement and alignment between uh, our policies and what's in the, uh, what's in the annex. The Bureau of Archaeological Research, Division of Historical Resources, Florida Department of State, uh, is the organization that is responsible under state law for the identification, research, promotion of archaeological and historical resources that are located on Florida's state managed lands. Uh, that's terrestrial and submerged lands. Uh, Florida has over 35,000 recorded archaeological sites, and this number is, is growing daily. Uh, the Bureau is staffed with experts with a variety of different research interests and technical specialties. Uh, we have an in-house conservation lab and a collections facility that I, I believe is currently housing over 3.5 million individual artifacts from Florida. Uh, in terms of, of how representative we are of the rest of, uh, of the states, uh, we certainly are uh, one of the leaders in, in the Southeast for historic preservation. The underwater archaeology program, which I oversee, is tasked with the management of over 18,000 square miles, uh, which is about 46,000 square kilometers of sovereignty submerged bottomlands, um, and that includes rivers, lakes, springs, sinks, uh, out three miles into the Atlantic and nine miles into the Gulf of Mexico. Th this area contains uh, an abundance of unique, sensitive, and significant archaeological resources that are, are really not found anywhere else in the country or the world. Florida is home to some of the earliest Native American archaeological sites in the United States. Uh, dating back over 14 and a half thousand years ago. Uh, these earliest sites are directly associated with water. Florida has the world's largest concentration of dugout canoes uh, with over 442 being recorded and we actually just were notified of two more last week. Uh, so every storm that comes, there's more. Uh, Florida is also home to the greatest concentration of offshore submerged pre-contact, i.e. pre-1492, sites in the United States. 
Uh, my state also contains a robust collection of historic shipwrecks, uh, both on the East Coast and the West Coast, and the U.S.'s highest concentration of Spanish shipwrecks. Given the unique geology and hydrology of the peninsula, archaeological sites in Florida often contain very well-preserved materials not seen in other parts of the country. To manage all of these resources, Florida has a team of five full-time professional underwater archaeologists and a fleet of small research vessels and geophysical survey equipment. Uh, my office also has an independent scientific diving protocol uh, program excuse me, that meets or exceeds OSHA, which is the Federal Occupational Safety and Health Administration guidelines. We regularly conduct archaeological research and surveys across the state that target a wide variety of resources. Our funding comes from both federal and state sources, but we're often the recipient of externally funded grants as well. Um, additionally, my office is responsible for the issuance of archaeological research permits. Um, these are tied only to state-managed lands. Uh, this strict and robust permitting program requires an appropriate research design, survey standards and guidelines, report writing standards, and collection protocols. Permittees must abide by the SAA, Society for American Archaeology, ethics guidelines. Permit noncompliance or failure to complete projects can result in applicants being ineligible for future permits. Uh, so we, we do have a little bit of teeth. Uh, our office works under a variety of federal and state laws that specifically outline our jurisdiction, our powers, and our duties, uh, including Florida Statute 872, which specifically protects unmarked human burials located both on public lands as well as private lands. Uh, to kind of sum up, we are not policymakers, we are just archaeologists trying to protect our resources. Uh, and one of the ways in which my office is attempting to um, have positive change is via more cooperative efforts, both with law enforcement and stakeholders uh, across numerous projects and sites. As in many parts of the world, unfortunately, underwater archaeological sites are being illegally disturbed and looted. Uh, following numerous discussions with state and local law enforcement who stressed the need for greater training, my office developed a proposal and then received federal funding to create the United States' first law enforcement training program specifically focused on submerged cultural heritage. By providing both classroom, on the water and underwater components. Uh, this program will provide law enforcement individuals the skills, knowledge, and ability to both protect archaeological sites and recognize when they are being illegally disturbed. If successful, this program could be implemented in other coastal straits across the country. Recently, the state led investigations at a middle archaic uh, that's about seven to 8,000 years ago. Uh, Native American sites submerged in the Gulf of Mexico that contained uh, intact human remains as well as other delicate organic materials. As this site was under threat both from erosion and from illicit looting, my office undertook emergency documentation procedures to record the site before it was lost. Conducting control test excavations in five centimeter levels in open water was technically challenging, uh, but we quickly recognized the value of collaboration and interdisciplinary support and created a diverse project team consisting of both state archaeologists, county archaeologists, federal archaeologists from three different organizations, private sector archaeologists, multiple universities hosting both faculty and graduate students, uh, nonprofit organizations, local and state law enforcement, community leaders, and most importantly, regular consultation with Florida's two federally recognized Native American tribes. With over 26 different organizations providing help and support, this project highlighted to me and also to my organization as a whole how the difficult, costly, complex, and time-sensitive nature of underwater archaeological work can benefit from a collaborative approach. 
in the spirit of collaboration and cooperation, I'm really happy to report that my office has expanded our cooperative efforts to stakeholders outside of the state of Florida. In 2019, French archaeologists from Drassen visited Florida to discuss management of the flagship of Jean Rabot. Lost in 1565 off of Cape Canaveral, the Trinity represents a significant turning point in Florida and France's history. Archaeologists from my office and Drassum worked together to preliminarily investigate the site. Uh, while the wreck has been subject to numerous and ongoing litigation from the private salvage entity that first located it, we remain focused on adhering to state and federal laws and aim to assist Drassum in their long-term management of the site. International cooperation between member and non-member states does not stop there. Florida recognizes the robust protections of the U.S. Sunken Military Craft Act towards both U.S. flagged vessels and foreign flagged vessels on non-commercial activity located in U.S. waters. In 2023, a delegation from the Spanish Ministry of Culture visited our office to discuss promotion and management of Spanish cultural heritage in Florida. As a result of this meeting, Florida and the Spanish Ministry of Culture, Cultural Heritage have newly established consultation protocols. When my office receives a research permit application directed at submerged Spanish cultural heritage subject to the Sunken Military Craft Act, the application materials are shared with the Spanish Embassy and the Spanish Ministry of Culture for their review and input. This process is a great step forward in the cooperative management of submerged cultural resources while remaining in compliance with existing state and federal law. Uh, these previous two examples embody a, a growing realization that submerged cultural heritage is part of our collective past. Uh, geographic boundaries, while useful in nautical charts, need not always delineate management responsibility of historic shipwrecks. As Florida's waters are home to a wide variety of shipwrecks, I hope to use the model established with the Spanish Ministry of Culture and apply it towards other sovereign states whose military craft and cultural material rests under my office's management. Cooperation between member and non-member states can lead to successful outcomes. A greater communication and collaboration serves to not only better protect our heritage, but also allows greater opportunities to promote our resources. Our mission in Florida is to protect our submerged cultural resources for the public benefit, and we look, fi look forward to finding new and creative ways to engage with stakeholders and the public. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Ryan. No sé si dejarte hablar mucho porque... Thank you very much, uh, Ryan, for your presentation. Actually, our collaboration between the two countries is wonderful, even though not both countries have ratified the convention. It is a pleasure working with the United States uh, on the basis of the annex of the convention. So despite not having ratified the convention, there is room for collaboration between the two countries, Spain and the United States. We first started our negotiations in 2023 with you and the collaboration and cooperation and communication between our two countries has been fundamental and very, very good uh, so far, always with the aiming of uh, discovering and protecting uh, cultural uh, goods and uh, common cultural goods. That is the uh, way ahead for both countries that have ratified and those who have not ratified the convention. So um, PCA, UCH is part of our history, of our common history, and it is ob our obligation uh, to make it known to the public. Now let me give the floor to Connie, who comes from, uh, from Ireland. We've been working very closely with her for the last two years. We've got a common legacy with the country of Ireland. 
It is a country that has been very active in terms of subaquatic underwater uh, archaeology. Connie will tell us about the work that they have been conducting and the project they have been conducting in the last uh, few years. They will also tell us about the steps uh, towards the process of ratification on the part of Ireland. We uh, Spaniards have understood very well how complex it is the way to towards the ratification of the Convention. Connie, you've got the floor. Thank you very much. Um, and I would like to thank, thank you, Martha, and thank um, um, the colleagues in the Ministry of Culture um, for inviting me here today, and also UNESCO, of course, and particularly Edward, who has been working closely with us um, over the last year. Um, it's my second time in Madrid, and there's never enough time in Madrid. Um, so um, I'm looking forward to looking around tomorrow sometime. Um, today, I'm just going to give a very kind of a broad overview of the process we're going through in the last year and a half, particularly um, to do with ratification of the UNESCO Convention. Um, but first, just to give kind of place us and who we are, um, I work for the National Monument Service and that's within the Department of um, Housing, Local Government and Heritage. And within that, um, I head up the Underwater Archaeology Unit. Um, the team, it's a team of three, it's a small team, but not so small because we have an aligned team under my colleague, Carl Brady, um, who oversees the marine planning and development side of things because our minister is a statutory consultee under the Planning and Development Acts as well. So we are able to directly um, input into uh, planning and development and ensure the protection of underwater heritage on that side as well. Um, so, um, so between the two of us, we, um, we have had, we have robust, robust, robust excuse me, um, legislation dating back to 1930 and the protection of underwater heritage since 1987. Um, but of course, um, we have yet to ratify the UNESCO Convention. Um, we have a long history of engagement with the process of the UNESCO Convention, um, particularly with my colleague, um, um, our senior archaeologist, Sean Kerwin, who has been at every meeting since 1996, right up to 2001. Um, so we have a long history of engagement, um, uh, both from, uh, as delegations to those meetings. I suppose just to explain that the reason that we haven't ratified isn't any kind of principle against the convention, it's that we needed to, um, it related really to putting into a domestic law a package for jurisdiction beyond our 24 mile limit. Um, and this was to ensure we were in line with both convention and UNCLOS. Um, um, but in practice, we have applied the UNESCO annex rules uh, throughout. Our, um, our practice of dealing with underwater cultural heritage. Um, putting into place domestic law that allowed us to ratify took a long time, in fact, well over 20 years. Um, and it ended up being wrapped up in the need to, co to look at and completely revise our heritage legislation, which we did over the, the process of those two decades. And this resulted in a new act, Heritage Act, being enacted last October. So we have a, a, a brand new Heritage Act um, since October last in 2023. Um, ratification, of course, will allow us um, to support international action um, and strengthen our participation and our collaboration beyond our uh, territorial jurisdiction and uh, um, promote and engage in the work of UNESCO. Um, Ratification will, of course, be uh, subject to our own government approval, so I, I need to point that out. So when we get to that stage, we would be confident that they will, hopefully. Um, um, inclusions of provisions within the new Act enabled, has enabled ratification of certain conventions, subject again, as I say, to government approval. Um, and it, they reflect a general policy to engage better in international efforts and with, with intergovernmental colleagues and organizations working in the field. Now, just to kind of get down to the most recent, um, 2000, oh, excuse me, I haven't been thinking about my slides. 
Since 2003 and into 2004, they have been particularly good years for us. Um, particularly successful where our, ourselves, the National Monument Service in Ireland, is, is rega in regard to that. Because, as I say, we have a new Heritage Act. Here it is, the Historic and Archaeological Heritage and Miscellaneous Provisions Act. Um, which was enacted in October last, but now needs to commence. So we're in the process of commencing um, the sections of that Act. Um, it will um, include additional layers of protection to our archaeological heritage, including our underwater archaeological heritage. And as I say, it now enables us to specifically ratify the UNESCO Convention. What we also began last year um, is drafting a national strategy for the management and protection of our underwater cultural heritage. And this was very much to ensure that we have in place, uh, kind of parallel to our uh, uh, process of ratification of the 2001 Convention, uh, to at government level to provide for greater protection across government departments of underwater cultural heritage. Um, and we hope that this should dovetail very much with our own existing new heritage and also with the, um, with the um, principles of the 2001 Convention. We have a draft, a high level objectives included in it. Here you see them um, uh, under various categories. And again, they not only include um, um, the need to protect underwater heritage, but to address um, the blue economy as well and engage with the natural heritage, which we are doing closely with our colleagues in our National Parks and Wildlife Service. So, 2004 then, where are we at? Um, we're commencing, as I say, various sections of the Act, and in fact last week we commenced section um, 158, which now places our shipwreck inventory um, on a statutory basis. Um, we have um, 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 ratified the Valletta Convention um, many years ago, which uh, focuses on the uh, need to inventorize, but now we have it at a statutory level, which when we have 18 and a half thousand shipwrecks recorded, um, uh, puts it on a much firmer footing. Um, we're at final draft stage for our national strategy. We have undergone um, a quite an extensive outreach um, a process during that with questionnaires going both nationally and internationally um, to all various stakeholders. We identified, we, we held five workshops and identified a whole host of, of stakeholders from government to recreation and leisure users to academic and training uh, colleagues and also our colleagues in the planning and development world because we needed obviously to include those and we've held workshops based on the questionnaire that went out um, and I'd like to thank Edward particularly for coming to all of those workshops. Mm. <laughs> so thank you Edward. Um, so we have gathered all of the information from those workshops and we held our final um, fifth workshop together, the steering committee um, and working groups uh, uh, just a couple of weeks ago and we're, dr we're drawing all that information together um, at this stage so we would hope that early next year we'll, we will have the final draft of the national strategy to go to government. Um, we will have to do an assessment of that first of course and go to public consultation but it will be uh, progressed and is progressing. And then Finally, well, that's our shipwreck inventory and all our shipwrecks right out to our continental shelf. And in regard to the process of ratification itself, um, we are in the process of commencing section two of part five, you see here in our new legislation. Um, that's where we're drafting the transposition table at the moment and drafting the memo for government. Um, the, um, we will have to engage with certain um, colleagues in other departments um, because they have um, an interest, such as obviously our Department of Foreign Affairs, but also our Department um, of Culture, which is a separate department and under which our National Museum um, um, operates. So we will be engaging with those as well on, on the ratification process. Um, We'll have to circulate um, a memo to the Office of the Parliamentary Council to commence 
um, the order for ratification and we would be hopeful within the next year of progressing that to government level and hopefully uh, ratification at that stage. So um, that's just a very quick overview of, of where we're at. Um, I'll, I'll give more information about our collaborations with our colleagues in Spain later on tomorrow, but um, I just really wanted to uh, update you all in, on, on our ratification process. So thank you. Thank you very much, Connie, for your explanation, for your overview of the ratification process. Hopefully next year we will celebrate your ratification. I hope that the Ministry for Culture is actually impressed at the high number of uh, wrecks in your inventory. So it's a vast inventory. I just don't think we don't have so many wrecks on our register. Well, we have uh, studied sunken uh, vessels from archives, but they are not, we don't have so very many wrecks on our inventories. Thank you very much for your contribution. Yes, tomorrow you will tell us more about the collaboration between Spain and Ireland in this invisible army. I will share an anecdote with you. We've been working since 2015-2016. They have a cannon that they found in the uh, vessel of invisible um, army, but it also comes from the Lepanto battle. So for you to see the importance, how a cannon have gone through so very many episodes in history, events in history. and. Well, now it is time to give the floor to our last speaker. Our last speaker comes from a German NGO, an NGO which has, uh, is accredited. It is Ansar Vogel. He is also an archaeologist. And he will tell us about the participation of civil society in the UCH and how from the NGO C contribution of Germany and how uh, Germany is managing and working on UCH. Thank you very much for this kind introduction and I would like to thank the Spanish Ministry for being here and uh, to speak here to change the ideas with you and I would like to send greetings from Peter Winterstein, our director, who was actually invited. It's a special honor for me to, who is relatively, relatively new in this industry. There is no doubt about it. Germany is in favor of this convention. All political groups, as well as the ministerial bureaucracy, always express their confidence to ratify someday. Unfortunately, this issue doesn't play a role in the public opinion. The number of people who are committed to this issue is small. The tardiness that Germany is demonstrating here by joining forces is therefore simply embarrassing for everyone. I would like to divide my presentation into five sections. Promises, circumstances, structures, hopes and challenges. German deliberations on the UNESCO Convention had already begun hesitantly in 2001 at the ballot in Paris. We abstained. The Sakwen petition submitted by the de Gouva achieved that the coalition agreement of the following government in 2013 contained the passage to commit the UNESCO Convention and to take initiatives to formally accede to the Convention. In the meantime, 2015, we got the notice that work on this is well advanced. But since then, our inquiries have been answered in the following ways. The authority has yet to be determined, because there is actually none. The positions of the federal states must be determined. In 2070s, it was promised that this would take place after the summer break. 
Important associations still need to be consulted. A key staff position in the department still needs to be filled. And the ratification is planned for 2021, but this was the time for parliamentary um, elections. There were signs of a change of government, and this did happen, but therefore we ask all the democratic parliamentary groups in advance, all parties promised to work towards early ratification and not one expressed even minor reservations. Instead, the development of legal instruments of the economic utilization of marine areas and seabeds in the coastal zone and beyond is making significant progress. After fishery, the focus is on the massive expansion of wind farms and other energy generation in, on the seabed, undersea cables, pipelines, and now increasingly also carbon capture and storage, and maybe in the near future, deep sea mining. In accelerated authorization, authorization procedures for some of these projects, environmental assessments may be shortened. Archaeological data can often be collected and emergency uh, excavation carried out during the time window of ecological assessments. So these opportunities are dwindling. In 2022, a new minister responded to our inquiry as if it were the first time that an implementation law has been, was being planned, a truism. He referred to other legal standards, none of which are new but inadequate. And at the end of last year, when asked, the Federal Foreign Office again emphasized the German government's intention to sign the resolution. This suddenly brought too much new information into play, namely a list of many federal ministers plus the Secretariat of Conference of Ministers of Education and Cultural Affairs of the federal states and individual federal states. They all have to participate in the vote on an implementation law, as if we were back in the year 2009. The discussion seemed to be starting all over again with people who have not been familiarized. We recently exchanged views with the opposition party and realized that the interested MPs and their staff had no other wrong ideas about the subject. They were cultural politicians, nothing against them. I come from the cultural sector. Cultural political of all groups like to take concern, like to take up our concerns. They may be door opener, but they don't make much progress because the foreign office is in charge. In response to my last inquiry there, I also received the long list of authorities and, unfortunately, the honest statement, our last statement, at present, it is not foreseeable when the ratification process can be finalized. Permanent structures. To exaggerate, one could say that what the UNESCO wants to regulate globally with its convention, Germany is not even doing a small scale for its territory. Archaeology is first and foremost culture, and culture is a matter for the federal states under the Grundgesetz, our constitution, and each, states, each state has its own heritage protection law. This doesn't mean that there are major differences between them, minor of course, but above all there are numerous authorities all responsible of their own federal states. And the federal states on the coast also share the sections of the territorial sea. German federalism means that there is no territory on the federal government that does not belong to a federal state and that no federal state has territory that does not belong to the federal republic. But what's about the exclusive economic zone, which, lie, which lies outside the national territory 
especially now with regard to cultural policy, which is in Germany decayed at the level of individual federal states, a darned problem. German archaeology abroad, on the other hand, has always been a matter for the foreign office, which make it, makes it quite confusing. Fortunately, it is clear that the federal government always takes the lead in external relations. That means that no federal state can consider itself to be the coordinating state, although this would be practical in individual cases. However, it's possible and in some cases common practice for the federal government to commission the federal states accordingly. In the ex exclusive economic zone, there is simply no legal basis for protection measures. measures. Without this and without territory jurisdiction, there is no need for action according to the scheme of an authority. And only when both exist, by convention and as a result of implement implementing laws, would it be possible to, to demand personal and equipment that an authority would need to take appropriate action. The fact is that both are lacking. Lasting hopes. The monument authorities of the coastal states could otherwise extend their work to the EEC, especially as they have the technical expertise on site and already represent the federal government in the context of administrative assistance. It is certainly irritating that hardly any of our neighbors on the North and Baltic Seas have ratified. So why we have fortunately Poland has recently joined in. Thank you. Go forward. Take us by the hand. <laughs> Five, hidden challenges, clear motivation. We must reckon that unspoken resistance to the commitments or persistent commercial interests are the real reasons for Germany's failure to ratify. What bothers us at De Guver is that the German ratification process focuses too much on its own zone of influence where it, its own cultural heritage is presumed to lie. This is pity and inefficient thinking we should, concerned, we should be concerned with more the best possible cooperation to protect the world's cultural heritage by means of multilateral coordination, newly adapted standards, reliable reporting. That's what we all want, I think. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Siempre es muy interesante ver el Thank you very much. It is always very interesting listening to the point of view of civil society, how they see the legislative processes and how they see the work conducted by the public administrations. For us, for the public administrations, sometimes it is very difficult to convey the message or to show how we work from the administrative side. This is why we believe it is essential to uh, bring together uh, the NGOs so that we can all understand better how civil society works and the perspective of the civil society. As you have seen, in, the, in Germany, we, you are facing a clash of competencies uh, between the federal states and the and the federal uh, and the states and the lender. Uh, it happens the same uh, to us in Spain. Sometimes competencies lie within the national authorities, other within the autonomous communities' authorities. As you have uh, rightly explained, sometimes the situation becomes very complex in uh, legal terms, and also in Germany, where we find a decentralized uh, federal state uh, system, the situation becomes very complex. 
uh, complicated. Just as the representative from Greece has told us, sometimes the competencies lie within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, others within the Ministry of Culture, and also in other countries, the Ministry of Defense, such it is the case of Spain, and in Spain, also some of the competencies uh, lie uh, within the Ministry of uh, Industry. I don't know if there are any questions from the audience. If not, I've got myself some questions to pose to these speakers. Hello. Good. I'm Alex from Portugal. Uh, all those points that you have shown on your map regarding the shipwrecks, are these actual shipwreck locations that you have pinpointed, or part of it comes from documentary and archival references? I wonder it. Uh, hi, Alex. Thank you. Um, we have four, about 4,000. We have about 4,000 of those 18,500 uh, 18 uh, with locations. So the rest are approximate, based on a whole host of sources, um, from the Admiralty charts to we have gone through newspapers, um, um, other sources, you know, international sources, uh, calendar state paper, everything. We have a whole archive, um, Lloyd's Register, everything. Uh, so a lot of them are, the majority of them are approximate <coughs> with 4,000. 4, we have a rec viewer that's online that you can tie into through our website and that it gives the ones with the actual locations, the 4,500. Thank you, Maria, and all the panelists uh, for a very interesting um, discussion and also uh, a, a nice mix of different perspectives to to the convention and um, and why why um, why the convention actually matters um, and why it's important to to ratify not or not the convention because I understand that as far as the sort of the rules in the annex are concerned everybody's on the same page so what what actually makes the difference you know uh, whether the country ratifies the convention or not um, and um, here I would like to turn to Arnaud because uh, DRASM uh, is, of course, an important player uh, in France uh, as regards the protection of cultural heritage. And I would like to actually understand, uh, in, 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 um, in addition to a kind of political signal uh, that the ratification uh, may send uh, if the country joins it, because it's a, it could be perceived as a, as a uh, um, expression of a, of a commitment to the fact that uh, underwater cultural heritage is important, uh, it should be safeguarded, and we, we need to do that jointly. Um, of course, you, you are the leader of, uh, of an important uh, actor when it comes to underwater cultural heritage in France, but as a practitioner, what, what difference has it actually made for, for you, for DRASM, that France has ratified the convention? Can you, can you think of some examples where you said, yes, thank God uh, uh, France is party to the convention <laughs> so that we can add to the, to the list of arguments that we have already identified? Thank you. Um, during 10 years between the adoption and uh, ratific French ratification, uh, French administration has a lot, lot of reflection and discussions. And during this time, uh, there was an increase, great increase of looting. So uh, in, uh, in France, we call uh, an official interministerial decision, we call it a blue paper. And in uh, 2012, there was a blue paper, I, I can read it. Uh, the conclusion was reached that despite its imprecision, the convention was the only instrument by which France could do anything to protect the archaeological heritage on his, its EEZ and continental shelf. So that's the main answer. With the convention, we are quite 
six times more competent because our maritime territory, easy and continental shelf, is six times larger than uh, territorial sea. So quite six times more competent and six times more uh, committed with partners. Without the, the, the convention, we were quite blind in this area. With the protocols of information, of um, uh, share of uh, discoveries, we can work better. And that's the first, the main point. Uh, the, the second point is, uh, it, I think the convention has positive economic and social effects. Because uh, it strengthens uh, a sector of activity in France, uh, linked to the protection, the study, uh, the enhancement of heritage. Uh, and we can more, uh, we have a better communication with the, the great public interests. And the, 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 the main point 90% of uh, wrecks are in EEZ and on continental shelf, not in the territorial sea. So to study maritime history, we have to work on this area. And to work on this area, we need the convention to build together uh, cooperation, uh, common, uh, common excavations. Uh, we can do it with uh, bilateral agreements. Uh, we already have it with Italy, uh, tomorrow with Spain, I hope so, and, and Croatia. But it's only bilateral, and it's uh, reactive cooperation. We know a site, we know a rake, and we decide together to work on it. The principle of the convention is we can work together even when yesterday we, don't, we didn't know this work, we didn't know this, uh, this site. We receive an information as a coastal, si the coastal state and we begin to build a cooperation with all the states interested in. That's the opposite way to work. It's a preventive operation uh, to mapping the, the uh, our, our maritime areas. Probably, we don't know them, but, but probably 300,000 wrecks in uh, our maritime areas. So we cannot do that alone. We, we even if we have two magnificent uh, offshore vessels, we cannot do that. We need to work with our neighbors and especially with Western uh, European countries. So uh, I think it's, uh, it's really, uh, it's a real progress for to have this, uh, to have ratified the convention. I, I told uh, last point, uh, uh, I told economy and social, but also uh, for ecology, because uh, we always have to keep in mind that all these rigs, all these sites are biotopes, are ecosystems. And when we protect a site, when we protect a rake and we study it, we also contribute to protect the ocean. And once more, we can do that alone in one 11 million square kilometers. So we are uh, convinced uh, now, uh, 11 years after the ratification, it was uh, a very, very efficient tool to protect UCH. Thank you very much, um, Maria, and all the panelists for your very meaningful interventions. And um, I see some hope from the miss missing states. Um, but. As Arno is linking, uh, highlighting the link between the protection of the ocean and the protection of underwater cultural heritage, 
Um, can we maybe raise the attention, and especially of the national authorities, the politicians, on the, um, the role of the convention in the fight against illicit trafficking? You all, you are all from countries where you have very strong police a department dedicated to the fight against illicit trafficking and you are involved in these issues through the judiciary, through the, the police, through the customs and of course uh, all the museum and uh, heritage managers and the link between 2001 and to speak about the UNESCO Convention 1970 is obvious and um, it's, an, it's an additional stone to, to, the, to the wall to uh, protect yourself and your neighbors against illicit trafficking and enhance also all these the issues linked uh, related to restitution. You were talking about the, 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 the looting of the for royal um, uh, wreck. So this is a real issue. We know that it's, it's linked also to organized crime. So can we find a um, more efficient way to convince your authorities and politicians and MPs that this issue is really at the, at one of the top priority in the protection of cultural heritage. Thank you. I, I, in France, we have a great chance. Before we, we ratify the convention, already uh, looting was one of the 22 missions of the maritime uh, administrations. Uh, we don't have in, in French a, a, guard, a coast guard, we have seven administrations, we work for function Coast Guard, and they have 22 missions. And since 2004, among these 20, 22 missions, there are Protect UCH. So uh, 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 the Army, the police, uh, customs, uh, uh, environmental police have this point at the uh, every day in the, during the mission, and it's very, very important for us. I, it's, uh, I think it's important to write this uh, in uh, all, the, all the regulations. I've got two questions. The first one is for Dr. Tsivekini. We know that the cultural origin of the wreck that has been recently discovered in France uh, waters, territorial waters. The second question is for Mr. Dawkins. You said that the jurisdiction in the state of Florida extends up to three miles in the Gulf of Mexico. Why such a difference? Yeah, the, the, the difference in, in jurisdictional uh, sovereignty really ties to the shape of the continental shelf. Uh, the Gulf of Mexico is, is very shallow in the coastal waters. Uh, you can be out three miles and still hop out and, and pretty much see the bottom. Um, it's, uh, whereas in the Atlantic, you don't have to go out very far and then you hit, uh, you hit nice deep nice deep water. Uh, it's not a very eloquent answer, but... <laughs> well, as for the origin, cultural origin, it is related to the ships that were carrying uh, wine, and according to our analysis, the analysis conducted by Papini, our geographer from, the Gen from Genoa, um, it was uh, discovered that it was an area between Pagia di Fundi and Mondragone. It was a wine-producing area, Grand Cru, uh, such as it is known in France, one of the best uh, possible uh, wines, according to Plinius. It was uh, referred that a ship with uh, part of the crew uh, coming from the southern area of France, very uh, similar to the necropolis in Tarquinia, so, a, a, a ship with flag, uh, Italian France uh, flag. Now we are examining the wooden uh, remains 
And we already know that on the basis of those analyses, on the basis of those analyses, and on the basis of the species and the type of woods uh, found on board, and also on the basis of the analysis of the wood and of the wood used for projecting the, the cargo, gives us an idea of when the journey was first started, and we have linked that to the concept of open seas. We are also analyzing the construction of the sea, and we are obtaining important data regarding its origin. Why? Because we have found a species coming from the Adriatic Sea. It doesn't mean that the ship uh, might have come from the Adriatic, but it means that there are some wooden pieces that comes from a species that can be traced back to the Adriatic Sea. However, we are at the first stages of the analysis of the, of the wood of the ship because our project first started in, in 2023. So we can now say that the origin of the ship is uh, uh, Italian and French. Thank you very much to all the panelists. I am Isabella Nelsinger. I am the chief uh, of, the, um, of the German uh, embassy here in Madrid. I've got so as far as I've uh, understood, uh, the United States have not yet ratified uh, the convention. Um, what are the main obstacles? And then um, from your point of view and from your practical work, what would be the main advantages uh, for the U.S. in ratifying the convention? Thank you very much. It's a big, it's a big question. Uh, and I will, I will be able to, to answer it only in, in the capacity that, uh, that I have. Uh, but, uh, and it was touched upon earlier, and it, it seems somewhat silly to, to put it so plainly, but the United States is a very big place. And the way our government is established, you know, we're all under the umbrella of the federal legal system, but each individual state, as it pertains to cultural resource management, uh, can have a lot of variability in how implementation occurs. And so, uh, you know, from from my perspective, thinking about how uh, adoption ratification might impact um, the entirety of the United States. I, I, I could see a, a, a difficult road ahead in terms of congruency between federal, state, and and the convention. Um, in terms of, of you know the the possible benefits that that might impact us in Florida, um, you know we. We strive, uh, and we, we consult the annex, you know, r regularly. Um, we we strive for in situ preservation, but sometimes uh, it's not always an option. Um, uh, and I'm I'm kind of getting a, a little bit off off track. Uh, but we have we have stakeholders in in Florida that uh, we we work closely with, um, as as do many other states, the the indigenous tribes, and. Uh, I, I could foresee potential difficulty between the convention aligning with those indigenous uh, desires. Um, so again, that, that necessarily wasn't a, a benefit. That was a, a yet another difficulty. Um, you know, one, one potential benefit is what we're trying to do, even without being a signatory member, is more inclusive cooperation uh, with member states. Uh, and you know, that was just touched upon briefly how, how that uh, can be a lot easier with adoption. Um, ho hopefully I answered that somewhat, somewhat well. If I can add something. Uh, if we have to work step by step, state by state, uh, don't forget uh, our goal is universal ratification. The convention will be fully efficient when we, it will be universal. Mm -hmm. Two months ago, we, are, we, we were notified of a, a French wake uh, in the EZ, the uh, Irish EZ. It was French boat, and the looter uh, is Belgium, 
and uh, the board is Panamian. So three states, three, uh, three states, but not yet island. And we are working with foreign departments are, are working together to, to find a, a solution. But if there was, if there is a universal ratification, no more this problem. We can work at every looting operation. Buenos dias, Pablo. I'm going to speak in Spanish. You can. Um. Good morning. I'm going to speak in Spanish. I've got a question. Uh, yesterday, I discussed uh, with Paloma and with other members of the, the government of Canada and also with the ambassador of Canada in Madrid. And uh, after listening to answer, and uh, that was a very interesting presentation. I can see that Canada, is the United States and Germany are facing major uh, difficulties in ratifying the convention. And having a representative from Germany and from the uh, German um, embassy here in Madrid is a significant step. It seems obvious that there is a difficulty in terms of the uh, ratification of this convention in relation to federal states. Are you aware at UNESCO, and maybe this, uh, my question is directed to Tulio and to Mariano, uh, in the sense that you are international law experts of the difficulties that this a convention poses specifically to federal states and which possible solutions can be envisaged, which possible solutions can be provided specifically to federal states. I don't know if anyone can answer my question, please. Well, I don't know if I'm providing an answer to your question, but what I would like to say that if a universal ratification of the Convention were possible, looting cases were, uh, would be very easy to solve. Uh, cultural and material heritage would also be better protected. Uh, even though the Convention would fully ratify, then we would have to see to its uh, daily implementation. We in Spain are, do not have a federal uh, state, however, we fully understand how complex it is to manage the different autonomous communities and the uh, coordination between the different uh, administrative levels. However, from a viewpoint, one of the main complex uh, of this uh, convention is in, uh, avoiding the illicit traffic of goods. For us, for Spain, that is not a problem because uh, um, in Spain, it has been considered that uh, archaeological goods are not uh, submitted or are not object of uh, uh, traffic, of commercial traffic. So in that sense, we have no problem. But the, the, I understand that managing uh, mm, right laws or maritime uh, rights is of enormous complexity. And I believe that the federal system poses an enormous uh, complexity that it is fully understood by most of the countries, uh, including Spain. Uh, Paloma, if, if you may, if I may make, may make a comment. So thank you very much for, for, for your briefings and uh, uh, there is a wide range of benefits uh, you may have uh, once you ratify the convention. And just following up on, 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 on the question uh, uh, asked by, by our colleague from the German uh, embassy, I would be more than happy, speaking in my 
capacities, Poland's ambassador, to organize bilateral uh, consultations on how to strengthen our cooperation between Poland and Germany, and uh, the underwater culture heritage should be an important instrument because right now we have a gap in the middle of, uh, of Europe, and I hope that Germany will, will, uh, will, will follow uh, a good example of uh, your neighbors. Uh, you, sh you will follow Paris and, and, uh, and Warsaw also in a format of a, a Weimar uh, Triangle, and I do understand that there are many legal challenges because of the different nature of states, right? But Spain is a federal state, just like Germany, <laughs> and I believe if there is a will, there is a way to ratify and also just to look from a broader perspective because to our countries, uh, to, to U European countries, the EU, we, we have invested so much in strengthening the international law framework and within the UNESCO framework, the intangible culture, uh, the, the underwater culture uh, heritage, it is one of these uh, key, 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 key elements of strengthening this legal uh, framework when it comes to, uh, uh, to, uh, to culture. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, just to say some words more to, uh, to, to share the experience of Italy after the signing of the con UNESCO Convention. Um, as you know, Italy has a long tradition in protection of cultural heritage also in the sea, so some people can say why uh, it was important for Italy to sign, because we, we have our law that protects everything and we are in, in this field for a long time. But um, I want to tell you this, the experience uh, after the signing of this uh, um, uh, convention uh, give us more um, uh, building capacity to increase uh, the institutions uh, devoted to underwater cultural heritage in our country. It's not only the cooperation that I agree with the colleague of, of DRASM, that uh, uh, thanks to the convention we are open uh, all over the world. We can uh, cooperate with uh, a lot of countries and tomorrow you will see how. But also inside, in our Ministry of Culture, for example, thanks to the convention, we have the opportunity to have a new national superintendency devoted to coordinate the underwater archaeology in all the countries. Uh, now our ministry is under um, changement, the, the ministry is changement, the, the organization of the Ministry of Culture, but this uh, superintendenza uh, works and give to the regional superintendency that we have in, in our country, give the, um, the opportunity to, to work more in the, in the sea. Thanks to the national uh, office, also the regional offices uh, increase their activities because they have the um, example, uh, good practices, uh, the um, uh, cooperation with our uh, capacity building so we can share uh, our capacity building with the, the colleagues in Italy. So it's not good only uh, sign the convention, it's not good only for uh, the foreign uh, affair uh, activities activities and cultural, but also for uh, the internal organization and uh, um, this uh, internal organization help us to increase the economy of the blue growth, the blue, uh, the, 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 the cultural economy. Uh, we open a lot of uh, m museums underwater uh, and uh, uh, and also we have the opportunity, we give the opportunity to young generation to work with new technologies. So there are other, um, other links, uh, other activities linked with uh, culture, underwater cultural heritage that uh, give, gave us uh, the possibility to increase uh, and uh, open new paths. So uh, this is our experience and that I'd like to share with you today.
Thank you very much. Peter Knott, I'm representing the Nautical Archaeology Society in the UK, we're an accredited NGO, but I'd like to represent one of our other accredited NGOs that couldn't come because it's not part of Group 1, but it does have something to contribute and that's why we're here as NGOs, we want to contribute. The Australasian Institute for Maritime Archaeology is, a, is similar to Dagua in that they have been driving the force for ratification in Australia. Now Australia is a long way away, but it's a big federal state, so Canada, America, you might get some examples, some inspiration from Australia. I believe, I, I'm, I haven't lived in Australia for 10 years, but I do believe that they are quite far along the ratification process. So if you need some, inf um, some influence and some inspiration, then I believe that Australia could be uh, a good idea for the big countries. Germany, you're a little smaller, but you're also federal states, so um, good luck. <laughs> Thank you for your, um, sharing your experiences. I don't envy you. Thank you. Um, Gracias. Tulio, me corrige, si no... Tulio, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think that is a problem for federal states. Actually, our Australian friend has just told us that those issues could be resolved. In the case of the U.S., U.S. have found a solution, that is to say, acknowledging the federal states, a portion of the territorial sea, where they have some uh, degree of competency, and the rest of the territory the territorial sea is competency of the states. The problem is that they have not ratified the UNESCO Convention of uh, United Nations Convention, of, nor the UNESCO Convention. So, in the case of Germany, Germany goes on and off due to, amongst other changes in the government, the level of interest, but. To date, well, actually, Germany in the past showed some uh, interest. Actually, the three land uh, uh, to the sea have, uh, well, have uh, shown an interest, but where does it finish? What do we do with the continental shelf? And the case in Canada as well, what's important that those four federal states, Germany, Canada, US, and Australia, even if Australia is, will soon ratify the convention, those sta federal states have always defended the application, implementation of the annex as best practice. And actually, US have uh, embraced it or included it as jurisprudence as part of the conditions and covenants that were uh, adopted. It's also part of the Treaty of the Titanic that obliges the U.S., the U.K., and France and Canada are yet to ratify. So they defend somehow the convention. And for reasons other than the actual convention, they have not yet been able to ratify the convention. The case of Turkey and Greece is a big problem. And the big problems that we do have in terms of ratification, and as Professor Escovazzi very well told us, the convention at the end of the day, Article 4, which is drafted in negative. Uh, so it makes it nearly impossible the implementation of the salvage law to UCH. And there are some states, well, that has been resolved in the U.S. already, some Asian states want to continue keeping up the business of treasure hunters and then application of commercial salvage to the uh, cultural heritage. Other than that, there is a territorial clause in the convention that would allow if any state of any federal state would like to implement the convention for some time up until the internal or national uh, norm is um, clarified, they could do so. Actually, as Maria said, nearly uh, federal states or quasi federal states such as Spain and to some extent Italian federal states have not had any problem in ratifying and others have found exotic uh, solutions. For instance, Florida recognizing three um, nautic miles on both sides, but, well, that's my viewpoint on that. I share the opinion of my friend uh, Mariano. 
uh, it's not a question of being a federal state or not being a federal state. Of course, federal states have their own complexities. But uh, the complexities are the same for every international treaty, not only for this convention. And in fact, federal states are parties to many international treaties, starting from the Anglos and going to the other UNESCO cultural convention. The problem, uh, for example, Italy is not a federal state, but there is a region which has an exclusive competence in the cultural field, and it is the region of Sicily. So the implementing legislation of the underwater convention was prepared in consultation with the region Sicily, and it was drafted. Uh, the problem is that certain maritime powers are afraid that uh, the UNESCO convention gives coastal states more jurisdiction beyond the 12 mile limit of the territorial sea. And this, in, in their opinion, is not allowed by the UNCLOS. But in fact, what the UNESCO Convention does is to provide for a system of cooperation, not an extension of jurisdiction, a system of cooperation among all the states which have a, an identifiable link with the heritage for protecting the underwater cultural heritage beyond the 12 mile limit. And that's the only way to protect such heritage. I have the feeling that I have to defend a little bit Belgium because <laughs> we're talking about Belgium as a looter. It was indeed a Belgian company, apparently, that was looting a French shipwreck in, in Irish international waters. But it is due, the problem that we didn't, apparently, the, our federal government didn't want to react is due to the, the complexity of our state structure. So the federal government, they are responsible for the her underwater cultural heritage in the, in the Belgian territorial sea and in the EEZ, but nothing else. And so the, the, the competence or the responsibility for underwater cultural heritage outside the Belgian territory is competence of the regions. But they did not yet implement the ratification. The federal government has already two implementation laws, but this aspect was outside their, their competence. So they referred to the regions, but the regions didn't have uh, adequate legislation to react. That's the reason. So I, th I thought it was useful to just add it. Thank you. Hello, good morning. I do not represent the state, I represent the common archaeologists. And so I have several comments and several questions. The first one is, why do we need a convention? For instance, I have worked with the Western Australia Museum, excavating a Portuguese ship in Australia, and I can say that uh, underwater archaeology in Australia is top-notch. They don't need a convention. On the contrary, Portugal, was the first country in this group to ratify it, but at the same time, after it was ratified, the Portuguese Minister of Culture was at the same time an administrator of a treasure hunting company. What was the purpose of having ratified the convention if you were not taking care of your underwater cultural heritage? Still nowadays, there is not a single boat that can operate in Portuguese waters. What is the purpose of having of a convention? And I can give you a comment because I do believe that I was the first archaeologist to go to court under a defamation um, accusation because I had been defaming this German treasure hunting company, Archeonautas. And they took me to court. And since Portugal had ratified the convention, and the convention is above the common law, and it has been translated into our legislation, I could use it to defend myself. And if it had been well translated into it, 
any Portuguese citizens or Portuguese vessels engaged in treasure hunting activities everywhere in the world, we could denounce them to the Portuguese police and they could be impounded. So the question is that I do believe from having seen, I'm old enough to have seen this movement to be born. I think that the convention was mainly directed against commercial treasure hunting activities. We had a guy from Florida, which uh, our colleague from Florida might know, Robert Marx, that bribed some Portuguese politicians so that we could have a treasure hunting law into effect. And um, we had the same Belgium guy, Robert Stenui, came to Portugal in 1975 and ransacking shipwreck sites. And as Mariano was saying, or I guess it was Tullius Covari was saying that if everyone ratifies it and gets it plasmated into their national legislation, then maybe if the people in Mozambique are being under the activities of treasure hunting, they can go to the country of the person that is doing archaeology or that is doing treasure hunting, like Margaret Rue from the United Kingdom did in Cape Verde, they can go to that country in specific and have those people accused of uh, looting and stealing. But uh, the, I think that the main note to take from my personal experience is that ratification is just the first step. And if you are not a country like Australia or France, then you really need to do some serious legal work so that we can stop the scourge of treasure hunting. And I've gone off the hook here. Thank you. Bueno, yo creo que no hay nadie más que quisiera hablar. Nos hemos pasado un tiempo. Well, I think there are no more uh, contributions. Uh, right, we have gone a bit over time, yet we do have enough time to have lunch. We will finish in lunch at 3 p.m. So we continue with the debate whether it is positive for, well, countries to ratify the Convention or not. Those of us who ratified are pleased and satisfied. After doing so, okay, now we break for lunch and we we'll see you back in here at 3 o'clock. <laughs>